Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 12th edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. And just go to my next screen if I can, which is not playing games morning. Uh, so my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps, and I'd like to welcome you formally to this morning's meeting. I'll just quickly run through this compliance and disclaimer screen. Um, just for anybody who hasn't joined us on any of the previous webinars, the structure of this morning's meeting be, will be we've got two companies to present. Each have got a 30 minute slot where we'll try and keep it to a kind of 20 minute presentation from the company and then we we'll leave 10 minutes open to Q&A. If you do have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box. Um, in your control panel at the bottom of your screen. Generally, please don't use the chat function and the Q&A function actually works a lot better for us. Just to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel in the coming days after we've edited and tidied it up a bit. And um, so if you want to go back and, you know, rewatch this, uh, if you missed a particular slide or the presenter skipped over it a bit uh, too quickly for you, um, please do so. Also, all the previous meetings are also up on the channel if you want to check out some of our previous presenters. Uh, if for anybody who doesn't follow us, uh, we're on Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, where we do um, a bit more some kind of longer form content than uh, is allowed on the on the Twitter side. And I also run a microcap subscription newsletter, which is uh, available via the Substack platform. Uh, if you just Google me on Substack, you'll find it. And now let's get to this morning's meeting without further ado. Our first presenter is going to be Mr. Sean Ankers, the CEO and MD of Energy One Limited. Sean is then going to be followed by uh, Russell Baskerville and David Hinton, the MD and CFO of Empire Limited. And with that, I'd like to hand over to our first presenter, Sean. Sean, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll let you know once you share yours when the cover slide is up and then you'll be good to go. Yeah, I can see your cover slide now, Sean. Wonderful. Can you hear me okay? Uh, audio is perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Um, just a quick introduction to Energy One Limited. Um, we all of these slides are available at our investor pack for the year. So um, if you if you want to look at those, uh, we've just reorganized it slightly to give it a slightly more narrative for the shorter format, but all of the information is available on the full investor pack. So a quick introduction to the company. Uh, energy One's been uh, in the energy trading software business for about 12 years, profitable for seven of those years. We are uh, in the market called Energy Trading and Risk Management. The acronym for that is ETRM. We offer soft, uh, software as a service based solutions for trading of energy in the physical energy and uh, uh, contracts energy market wholesale. What does that mean? Wholesale energy in this context means uh, electricity and gas, power and gas, but also allied uh, commodities such as uh, oil um, and coal and carbon and environmental trading. The company has offices in, uh, in three broad locations, Australia, UK and France, with some 200 installations in 17 countries. Uh, we have um, 100 118 staff now. Um, the, the market share in this country is approaching 50% of the energy trade in this country is, is passed through our software and a considerably uh, smaller market share in Europe, which is our, our long runway for growth. As I mentioned, we have uh, we have several years of profitable trading. This was the most recent result for the year. Obviously, that slide's available, uh, and we can talk about that a bit later. But um, suffice to say that uh, this contains um, a full year of our Contigo UK business and one month of our French business as well, on top of the Australian core business. Uh, just a quick introduction to the market, because um, obviously uh, it's, a, it's a fairly unusual sort of um, Marketplace, well, energy trading, uh, what does that mean? Uh, there's two broad streams for that. We've got physical energy trading and contract energy trading. Physical energy is electrons and uh, molecules of gas moving through pipes and wires. 
uh, traded energy is often derivatives uh, and contracts uh, uh, between counterparties, OTC contracts and exchange traded contracts as well. So there's two broad streams to it, the physical purchase and movement and consumption of energy and the, the trading that, that hangs off that whole process. And just to illustrate that point here in the contract trading, if I look, refer you to the top part of this, this chart, we've got the electricity generators here who are, these guys are long energy. And over here on the consumer side, the energy retailers and on sellers, they're short. So the energy, particularly in this country, passes through a spot market. So all, all our generators must offer into the market and all takers and users of energy must take from the market. The spot market price obviously varies. Uh, it's, a, it's a gross pool, so the price goes up and down depending on demand. Uh, and it can vary from minus uh, $1,000 a megawatt hour to plus $14,000 a megawatt hour. So there's a, there's a, a very um, broad range of spot, spot prices. So the generators will take spot and the retailers are gonna pay spot. Uh, obviously, um, these, two, these two parties here on opposite sides of this this, uh, this arrangement and there's a natural hedge to be had there. So they'll often enter into a contract for difference with each other by an OTC contract here uh, or, or uh, using exchange traded derivatives. And so that's the, that's the cornerstone of the, uh, of the energy trading market and certainly in the contracts trading, it's predominantly a hedging process, but there's a, there's a lot of other markets operating as well. There's, uh, there's, we have pure financial traders and we have um, ancillary markets for, for all kind of market stability aspects, uh, including frequency control. Uh, there's, there's a market for green certificates, there's a market for PPAs, and a, a whole variety of ancillary markets going along with that. So essentially it operates much like any commodity market uh, in terms of the, some players are physical players uh, and others are, are purely um, financially settling. Uh, the, the difference between electricity in particular and a traditional commodity is that you can't store it, not in any meaningful way anyway. And so the contracts have to be valued continuously, uh, it's, it's certainly every half hour. And in the future, short the next year, there will be valued every five minutes going out for the life of the contract, which might be up to five years. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. In the physical side, we've got a, a lot of um, energy being traded through um, moved around so it's consumers and users of, of energy. They must get the energy from one place to another. They must get a source of supply and then source transmission through pipelines and wires. These red arrows here indicate where Energy One software is, um, is useful throughout that whole process. And you can see that we, we pride ourselves on having a wide variety of wholesale trading solutions. Although we traditionally are not operating in the retail end of the market, which is more of your billing systems, which are down here. Um, and, and, and meter reading and the like, that's not us. So we're in the wholesale energy trading part. We have a, a comprehensive suite of software for this. We like to offer our customers a variety of solutions for various business processes that they're operating. With, as I said, physical bidding and nomination of, of energy into the physical market, uh, ETRMs, uh, which is contracts, but of course there's a middle office function of that, which is related to the fair value of the derivative over a long period of time. Often these books have to be valued every day. Uh, and there's a whole variety of um, valuation metrics used for that. The most common of which is value at risk. We have a market analytics capability as well. Uh, for, it's a Bloomberg terminal for, for, for energy. So the uh, users can drill down onto the market um, dynamics and a whole bunch of things associated with the business process automation of, of just moving energy around on a day-to-day -day basis, logistics and the like. This is a, it's quite a detailed slide, but it essentially points to the variety of things that we can offer. Um, there are a finite number of customers in the, in, the, in the energy industry. So the focus is very much on being able to offer more than one set of functionality to those customers. In this country, you might have uh, this sort of 250 registered participants. In Europe, there's something like 1,500. And so it's the emphasis is on being able to supply them with, with a solution that covers more than one market need. Uh, our customers are often large, but we have a variety of smaller customers. They're also you know, the utilities, infrastructure providers. They are providing an essential service, and the software that we supply is mission critical. 
So we don't, we don't trade energy and we don't take a, a position on behalf of the customers. We are supplying support software to that to enable them to transact with the market or with each other and to value, capture value and settle any trades that they operate. The software is predominantly SaaS deployed and supplied remotely. Uh, as we pointed out before, we were not materially affected during COVID because uh, of the essential nature of the software and the services that we provide. Our revenue model is derived from license fees and support fees and, and bundled together, we call those SaaS fees, which is a recurring revenue stream. Uh, something like 79% of our, our revenues are recurring, but we do receive uh, TNM fees, project one-off fees for installations and customizations. And those license fees are driven by both volume and functionality structure. So the more seats or the more complex your operation, therefore uh, the change in license fee. Uh, just a, a brief snapshot of some of our customers. Obviously some of them are multinationals with a large portfolio of both generation and retail assets. Some of them are single play uh, pure play, um, perhaps a generator, a wind farm, or perhaps a, a retailer, uh, or a gas transmission company. So uh, there's a variety of customers in our portfolio across the globe. Just a quick look at the financial re uh, review. As we, we pointed out, the uh, customer base is, is quite sticky because this is essential services. Um, we we do endeavor to uh, work with our customers at all times to make sure the software is doing what they need it to. It's a very complex marketplace uh, and obviously credibility uh, for the vendor is, is very important. The, um, in, the, in Australia alone, there's some $13 billion of energy traded each year in the physical market. And so obviously these are large exposures for our customers and they need to have reliable systems. And obviously change in, changing systems is not something that you rush to do. So it takes uh, credibility and, and reputation are very important, which leads us to have a, a, a customer base that, that generally is, is um, of low churn. You know, here there is some churn in the market because we, we do supply software to smaller, new entrant retailers and the like. Often these companies will exit the market and that's predominantly where our churn comes from. So it's a market exit. Uh, we, uh, we don't usually um, experience um, much loss to competitors or other 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 systems uh, due to the fact that we try and stay close to the customers and it's a very complex industry. I'll point out here that the um, uh, we have a contract length of uh, usually three years to start with with automatic uh, or a regular annual renewals, although that can go up to five years or in some of the other products it's, it's a year to start with. The gross margin is um, 60 odd percent as we point out here. This is um, one of the reasons for this is that we have um, uh, some 23, 25% of our revenue is project revenue, which is, uh, it does lower the overall gross margin, obviously, but the, the point is that it enables us to put the customer, put the installation in for the customer and to, uh, to work with them. So they, they stay on with us uh, over, the, over the longer term. We also, as I mentioned, work closely with uh, customers and regulators to ensure that the, the products are, are meeting the needs, meeting market changes and, and performing as they need them to be. This is obviously translated into uh, <coughs> um, a business that's been successful recently. The um, compound average growth rate over the last four years for revenue has been 50% and earnings just 41%. As I mentioned, annual recurring revenue is, is important to us. Um, it's 79 odd percent. It does fluctuate depending on whether we have some big projects in a year, some big installations, but generally it's well over 70% and often close to 80. Quick look at the company outlook. Um, as I mentioned, we've got something like 50% of the Australian market here. Uh, the rest of the market, there's some, there's some vendor, some vendor activity in this country, a lot, a lot of legacy software, a lot of spreadsheets are used in this industry and things that may have been built in-house uh, traditionally by some perhaps larger, larger customers. In Europe, there's more competition, there are more vendors, but there's also a much larger marketplace. It's some 10 times the size of the Aussie market and we've identified that as a, um, as a source of growth. Uh, 
this year, some 44% of our revenue was, is coming from Europe. That's after two years of, of, of operating there. And we expect, um, expect that to grow. We're looking to, as well as these um, uh, acquisition paths, organic growth. We only have 5% of the European market share. We've demonstrated that we can build 50% of the market share historically. So we back ourselves to get uh, growth organic in that market. Our most recent acquisition I'll just touch upon is a, a great company that we've um, merged with in France, Easy Energy. They uh, are predominantly in the physical energy uh, scheduling space, which complements our contracts trading uh, functionality for Europe very well. Um, they are expected to contribute um, uh, $1.1 million of EBITDA and FY21, which goes to our, our acquisition strategy, uh, which is that we look at uh, strategic goals for acquisitions, which are that the um, earnings accretive immediately upon acquisition that they bring some uh, technical or product synergy to the company and that they may uh, expand our, our reach geographically or for some other reason, perhaps into a new, a new and allied market space. Uh, this strategy we've had in place for some time now, as I just alluded to, um, we, we do work on that. Um, we look for organic growth. Uh, we look to expand our product solution set to enable uh, us to um, be able to offer more products to the same customers and to increase the margin there, but whilst also supplying a better service to the customers because they only have to deal with one vendor, not a variety of vendors. Um, just a quick note on our European business. Contigo now has been with us for nearly a year and a half. Uh, the company's going well. Uh, we, we initially forecast um, sales and EBITDA and they've exceeded that by 28% in the first year. Looking forward to the year ahead, we've, we've forecast guidance of uh, $25 million of revenue and um, an EBITDA of $6.5 million. And again, there's more detail in the full presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Mark. Any questions? Uh, yeah, we have some questions. Um, sorry, just to let people know, we actually have uh, Andrew Bonwick, the chair of Energy One, who's actually fielded a few questions while you were talking, Sean. But I actually got a few. I, I actually got a few emailed in, so I'm going to tackle those as Andrew's already tackled some of the some of the live ones. But there's still some outstanding live ones. Um, one question. I mean, who are your main competitors in in the space? Is there other companies like you? Or are you competing with? Uh, you know, in-house software. Yeah, so there's, there's a variety of um, competition. The, there's the in-house legacy systems, which may have been bespoke builds or uh, spreadsheet related. These um, have got a certain finite life, you obviously spreadsheets because the auditors uh, get involved and compliance involved and we're talking large, large portfolio values. And so the, the need for a proper system arises sooner or later. In the vendor space, uh, well, of course, you know, we're a vendor. There are a variety of, um, we, we're obviously quite uh, dominant in this, in this marketplace in, in, in Australia, but globally, there's two or three very large players, uh, usually American-based, uh, that's sort of in, you know, on the international scene. And then each market will have its local, um, local regional powerhouse or local hero who uh, operates perhaps uh, does very well in one country or in one particular space. Uh, perhaps you know, sort of scheduling or gas or something or some particular area, because obviously energy trading is a very broad spectrum of activities and commodities. So uh, companies will specialise in certain areas. But uh, so in Europe, we do see more competition from conventional vendors going up for an RFP and the like. And and so our point of differentiation is that we're offering a, a wide suite of of software enabling the customer to get more of the task done with us. And also we specialize in having software that's uh, easy to install, reliably installed, and is ready to go. With a history of blowouts in, in IT projects, uh, this is a valuable, uh, a valuable differentiator, having a, a, an easy to install and reliable piece of software. Um, and that kind of leads nicely into my second question that we've emailed in ahead of time. Um, You've, you know, bundled up a, a lot of different pieces of software and businesses over the last couple of years and integrated to give you that kind of 
more full service model. Um, how has cross selling of you know the various products um, and services gone with you know existing customers over the last three or four years? Yeah, it's something we do focus on, as I've pointed out, because there is not an infinite number of customers. It's a key priority to, to sell them more than one module um, or more than one product for more than one activity. So we may have we may have um, a customer that's just using the analytics product, and we may talk to them about whether they'd like to you know, look at the software for trading physical energy or contract energy or some other some other element. We have done we have uh, some pointed examples of that. Uh, certainly with Contigo, for example, we, um, you know, that's a good case in point for Europe. So although Contigo has a product that's a European based product, uh, they have won a, a project uh, with a, a large uh, European utility that they used uh, the UK product put together with an Aussie product. So that uh, bundled together a solution that meets the client's needs, which uh, either party probably would not have won on its own without the without that aspect to, to be available. And likewise, uh, we um, with Easy Energy, the cross sell was uh, story was assisted by the fact that Contigo, our UK company, and Easy already had three customers together because they sell complementary products. And just after the um, the transaction was complete, they together won another large large. Um, iconic uh, European utility while off being able to bundle those two products together. So what we look for is, is not just operational synergy attached to those products, but the ability to win additional work that might not have been forthcoming had you not had the ability to offer a solution cell. So yes, we do focus on that. Uh, we pride ourselves on the customers using more than one product and more than one module, and that's a key priority. And some of the online uh, live questions um, price increases and um, maybe if you can just talk about that you know what is a standard price increase and you know is it kind of built into a, a multi-year uh, license agreement where you know it just steps up automatically or or what has traditionally been um, the way you handle price increases Yes, yeah, so we do have we do have um, uh, annual increases, which would be consistent with CPI or some other mechanism like it, that uh, are either built into the standard agreements, but also into the rollover agreements. So all of our customers would uh, would expect that um, as as you know as CPI increases our costs, then of course the fees must be adjusted accordingly. Okay, and then. What is the typical sales cycle? Um, you know, level of customization, installation time frame, and I guess in COVID times, do you need to be on site to do an installation, or can it be done remotely? Well, to answer the question, second question first, no, you don't. Um, uh, Europe's locked up, for example, where they're busy installing a, this utility without it being able to travel. Uh, so, being, being SaaS based, we can do that remotely. Uh, we are able to talk to the customer via Zoom and the like. The, um, the sales cycle depends on the size of the customer. We, uh, because of the fact that there's not, again, an infinite number of customers, the big customers aren't always coming to market at all times. So we have a variety of um, you know, more like more um, easier to ship, so more entry level products. So we have what ones that could be installed in an afternoon for an analytics package, for example. So, uh, or a major project might take a year and 18 months, two years if it's a large installation with lots of customizations. The sales cycle can take any can take quite a long time with a large customer because as we talked about, these are mission critical systems. So it could be uh, years while working on a customer before you, you before you get a big a big uh, a big customer. But the as I said, the smaller the smaller guys who are a bit more nimble. You know, it could be a matter of a couple of demonstrations and then you've got, you've got the sale. So it does vary. And we, we do like to have a variety of, of uh, diversified customers so that, uh, again, where we're shielded from perhaps ups and downs related to uh, uh, major procurement cycles. I've just got another uh, email one in. Um, any interest in getting into retail so i guess you're really fully end to end or do you want to you know stay in the various components 
going back to that uh, diagram slider on the wholesale mm. side of things. Yeah, so we, we have specialized in, in wholesale market. The retail market is a very different space. Um, it's going through a lot of change at the moment, obviously with um, price caps in Europe and the like. So the retail market is suffering a little bit and, and, and others have experienced that. Uh, the wholesale market is a niche, of course. It's not as wide as retail energy, but it is a very, uh, it's a very deep and um, deep and important niche. And so we 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 choose to focus on that. Uh, the amount of wholesale trading is um, in the world of energy is is huge. The task is huge. Customers make a lot of their you know big customers make a lot of their income from the wholesale market. And so uh, we feel that um, our specialization in this area has been, been worthwhile and something we'll pursue. Yeah. And then uh, just a question on um, with your European business getting, uh, you know, a larger and a more substantial part of revenues. Are you doing anything in terms of hedging um, the effects rate for, you know, bringing it back home to Aussie dollars or what's, have you, what policy have you got in place there? Well, we, we do operate um, active risk risk management, so uh, we don't, um, you know, and the annual report has some detail about that. But generally speaking, we are we are sort of monitoring the process. These these uh, operate companies are operating within their own within their own um, economic space. Uh, the the European um, it, uh, our European business now enables us to to reduce the effect of a Brexit hedge, for example, which was uh, sorry it was a Brexit hedge against any of those, uh, those um, uh, headwinds that may have come from that. So that's just an example of building a natural hedge to overcome some of the more uh, short-term currency exposures. Okay, great. And then um, in terms of, you know, continuing to scale the business, I mean, it's already grown a lot, um, you know, over the last couple of years, but, you know, what investment is required, I guess, to, to kind of you know let's say double revenues over the over the next five years is is it in r d on the software side is it you know sales and marketing trying to you know get the foot in the door more customers uh you know wh- where where's the investment needed do you think well we definitely um we definitely continue to focus on the product this is a very uh, it's a very important product based industry uh, functionality is all is all important. So continually investing in the products and enhancing them, and and putting them together to get a solution that's a key part. There's no doubt that in Europe, it's more of a there is more of a sales and marketing story than there is in this in this country. Uh, we tend to know many of the participants in this country, whereas in Europe, being so much bigger, 500 million people, there's a there's more opportunity to pursue conventional sales and marketing. Channels, which is why the uh, you know, the uh, the customer acquisition cost is slightly higher in Europe, um, which has dragged it down in this in this year. So uh, we're looking at trade shows and you know more cold calling and the like, and getting involved in more more tenders and RFPs. So there's definitely a, a relationship between the amount of energy we put into into sales and marketing and the and the outcome for sales. Uh, although um, you know with uh, with a lot of our customers, we, we do look for the relationship part of the sell, which helps to keep some of those costs down. So if we know, already know the customer, then obviously our, our marketing costs come down. Okay. Sean, we're, we're just about uh, out of time. Thank you very much. And, and thank you to Andrew as well for feeling a few of, the, few of the questions in between time. If you can stop sharing your screen, thank you. Uh, I'll hand over to Russell Baskerville from Empired, who's going to be our next presenter. And I, I'd also quickly like to uh, thank Russell for getting up at the crack of dawn over in uh, in WA in part uh, to present to us this morning. Hi, Mark. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, Russell. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you, Mark, very, uh, you know, for having me along and coffee microcap for the invitation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you and, and welcome to Empire. Uh, Empire is an IT services and tech, digital technology company. And I've got to say, you know, um, before I get into this presentation, Running a technology company right now today couldn't be more exciting. You know, it's a real privilege for me to sit in in this chair and have an organisation in Australia that 
you know, I think is helping so many uh, unique and different organisations that that are finding many. Mark, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Sorry, I thought someone was about to say something. That is, that is just seeing so many different challenges that organisations are fa facing. Um, so, you know, whilst I think it's it's been a very, very tough time, it, it absolutely has changed the way in which businesses are, are transacting with each other. It's to change the way socially that, that we work as humans. And that's that's generating tremendous demand on the on the technology industry. So, so you know, we're pretty excited about, uh, I think, thematically the prospects for this industry over the coming years and, and how our organisation is positioned to help service that. Uh, so just jumping in to the presentation. So uh, as I said, Diversified Technology Services Company, we've really positioned our business around uh, three key operating units. Um, and the first is digital operations. So digital operations really is all around running and maintaining core IT systems uh, or core IT infrastructure for our clients. Our clients are typically large, mid to large corporate and government organisations. And one of the beauties of this part of our business is it generates long-term multi-year recurring revenues and uh, so builds that annuity base and also allows us to work with our customers very closely, obviously over a long period to understand their challenges and provides an opportunity to sell, you know, additional solutions and services to the customer. And I'll talk about that uplift shortly, but uh, a very important part of our business. Uh, a lot of people refer to it as managed services. And, you know, it's certainly a part of our business that we're seeing uh, significant demand in today. And, and just to conceptualize it, I'll, I'll give you an example of the digital operations business. Uh, we recently announced a $65 million contract with Western Power. Um, that, that contract is really to run and maintain the, the IT infrastructure that supports all of the power distribution network in Western Australia. So it looks after the networks, looks after the data centers, we manage uh, all, of, all of their back end data, um, and then all of their end user computing as well, whether that's mobile devices, whether that's uh, tablet devices, phones, PCs, uh, you know, so it, it really is a solution that it manages all of the end-to-end -end infrastructure for Western Power. And we provide the, the software and systems to monitor all of that, and then the, the physical labor to go and support and, uh, and maintain all of those systems as well. However, we don't provide any of the hardware. You know, we are a services and software business. Uh, and then we have our digital solutions organization. And digital solutions really is, is, is around two key areas for us. It's around the data space, and we're just seeing phenomenal growth in the amount of data that organisations are collecting and, and they need uh, consulting services and software solutions to take that data and make good sense of it, better understand what's happening in their business or what's happening in their customer base, and then use that data to, to take actionable insights, right, to actually go and change the way they're running their organisations or change the way that they're marketing to customers to improve margins, to improve efficiency in their organisations. Um, so that whole data business is, is a very strong growing business for us. And we also have a, a, an area of our business in there called business applications, which re really is all around uh, customer relationship management systems, uh, enterprise resource planning systems, finance systems, and we design and build those systems for our customers. And so we see across those two areas, that really becoming the heart of an organization. Yeah, if we can collect and manage all of the data that the front end of their business is, is collecting, whether that is in a mining operation or whether that is in an insurance organization data around a customer, but then also record and report all of their core financial information and process information, bringing those two together can be very, very powerful in terms of how we change a business and, and change the products and services that they're providing to their customers in a, in a digital world. So pretty exciting part of our business. And then our software solutions business is around uh, software, either full software applications that we have designed, uh, or whether it is around software applications for an industry that we have designed to help accelerate a very customer specific solution. So two different areas of the business there. Uh, a great example of that is our cohesion software. Cohesion is a, uh, 
enterprise content management system. It's the largest uh, information and enterprise content management system used by public sector in New Zealand. So it has a, around 12,000 active users on that system today. It's a true SaaS software as a service model and uh, you know, growing strongly as well. Uh, so, so the business, the, this next, next kind of pillar talks around our differentiation strategy. And that really is all around identifying key industries where we see growth and then building software solutions in IP that are relevant to that industry that provides them solutions that give them faster time to value or value at lower risk. And what that does is it provides us a great way of selling either digital operations or digital solutions to customers with a real industry specialization or with some real software differentiation. In terms of scale, the business is about a thousand people, principally across Australia and New Zealand, and, and we have offices in every capital city across, across those two locations, so 11 offices. We've got US, USA up on here, and look, certainly our strategy is very clear. We're an Australian New Zealand business. We have a small US presence, we've got about 30 staff up there that predominantly work with, with one of our major partners, Microsoft, and I'll talk about that shortly too. The business has a high level of repeat revenue, nearly 60% of work came from long-term multi-year contracts last year. Yeah, broadly, it's about $165 million in revenue this year. And uh, go, going into the coming years, we see this as an amazing platform for growth. There's been a lot of investment, whether that is capital investment in, in software and infrastructure, or whether that's investment in kind of systems management tools to grow and scale the business. And so we see uh, disproportionate earnings growth to revenue growth uh, as, we, as we expand the business in the coming years. Little, little bit of history. Um, you know, this, uh, this quick snapshot of 10 years. 10 years ago, the business really was born as a, an IT outsourcing type business, chasing this annuity revenue that you see in the yellow. Uh, over the coming years, the business has really acquired into the digital solutions space and the cloud space and, and also used acquisition to grow into the East Coast. In parallel, it's won some amazing you know, large multi-year contracts, 50 million with Rio Tinto, 48 with Main Roads uh, and, and a whole range of others. Uh, and, and then it's gone into this kind of period in recent time of, of being reasonably flat. And that was a, a largely around the integration of all of our systems, getting our services and solutions portfolio right and really aligning that to the market. Uh, you saw a small dip in FY20, and I'll discuss that shortly, obviously, uh, you know, some coronavirus effect there. And, and then, you know, bringing all of that together with this major contract with Western Power, that, that is the largest contract the company has ever signed. And, you know, over time, we, we see that becoming a, uh, you know, a kind of a, a very large uh, multi-million dollar customer for us. Just quick touch on strategy. Yeah, as I said, clearly an Australian New Zealand business, $36 billion contestable market. Yet yeah, in our view, there would be very few, I'd be too uh, bullish to say we're the only one, but very few other ANZ based players that comp could compete on the, the size and complexity of contracts that we deliver on in the, in the kind of larger enterprise outside of the big multinationals. So really finding ourselves coming up against some of those larger multinationals where we get real com uh, competitive advantage using local expertise on the ground here, you know, local grown IP, um, you know, and, and also allows us to be cost competitive as well. Microsoft's got to, got to be our number one partner. We have a range of partners, many partners actually, but Microsoft by far is our focus uh, with nearly a thousand or probably over a thousand Microsoft certified professionals. Customer base is mid to large corporate and government. Uh, you know, we really don't do a lot in the, in the we don't do anything in the SME space. Um, and we find certainly that they're the customers that are investing in digital transformation. They're the customers that, um, you know, have capacity and budgets to actually do some pretty significant projects on a continuing basis. It's not like they're going to spend $2 million on one project and that's it. Typically, we find that budgets repeat and grow every year in that customer segment. Uh, the business, you know, as I said earlier, maintains a real focus uh, on this recurring revenue piece. And uh, we did see but the shift to cloud in the last kind of, and, and that is absolutely happening at pace at the moment, but in the last three years, we felt customers with this new model struggling a little bit with what and how they outsource. And I think they've come to grips with that. And we're just seeing incredible demand in that managed services space at the moment. In fact, I'd, I'd go as far as to say the pipeline 
in that managed services space for us, and we've said this publicly, is, is that uh, you know, it is, is probably the strongest pipeline we've ever had. Uh, and then our solutions revenue is very important to us, um, be, A, because it gives us the opportunity to capture significant growth uh, in a market which is investing heavily in, in that cloud and digital transformation space. But, but also, I think in our, in our operations business, it allows us to retain real relevance and, um, and strategic importance to that customer set. You know, if all we're ever doing is running and maintaining their businesses, then we become somewhat commoditized. But if we're running and maintaining core business systems and doing that well, but also talking to them about, you know, what's coming down the down the down the sort of track over the next 12, 18 months and how how can they embrace these technologies to transform their businesses, then we become a much more important piece of the pie. So it's a very, a very important part piece to the puzzle and it's a piece that we continue to invest in and continue to grow and uh, I've talked already about our industry and IP strategy to differentiate and improve time to value for customers. Key strategic priorities right now I guess there's a lot there number one you know building that recurring revenue focus I think that Western Power deal at 65 million dollars gives us you know given it's a recent large win you know, I think is really important for us to leverage that into some other large customers and say, here's why Western Power, we're, we're interested, here's, here's how we won that deal, here's, here's the innovation and value we can bring you different to some of those larger multinationals. And, you know, they, they yeah, touch wood, I should say, as long as we continue to deliver, they'll be an amazing reference for us in those bigger deals. And, um, you know, it's a big focus for us to leverage that win into, into other customers right now. Um, as I said, you know, building leadership position in that data business and cloud business for us has got to be a key focus and, and we're continuing investing great people and, and grow our capability in that space. And then this says grow market share East Coast and Auckland. To be honest, really, that's East Coast. We have to say Auckland really because in New Zealand, we're twice as big in Wellington as we are in Auckland, but Auckland's twice the market size. So we do need to grow our business in Auckland. But the real focus today is to continue to build our business on the East Coast. Just wanted to talk quickly about our alignment to Microsoft. Um, you, you look, these are, the, this is really an assessment of Microsoft's uh, cloud businesses or their Microsoft Dynamics platform in here as well, which is now also in the cloud. To note, all of these uh, multi-billion dollar businesses, and this is last financial year's results pre-COVID where, you know, Microsoft just had uh, phenomenal demand on their products as people look to, to work differently through this period. So I'd, I'd anticipate, you know, improvement in these figures, but that's just me. Don't want to talk on behalf of Microsoft, but th these are these are phenomenal growth rates, right? If we look at, um, you know, something like the Office 365 product, which has been around for a long time and, and it's transitioned to cloud. And then the fact that that business is growing at 33% on, you know, probably one of the largest segments that Microsoft has, phenomenal. Um, you look at the Azure cloud growth, again, multi-billion dollar business growing at 70%. So we think that they're a great partner to be aligned with. We think that if we can help provide, uh, you know, solutions and services that, that, that leverage off my, the Microsoft platform, we can help, we can pot potentially capture some of this amazing growth. Um, you know, we're the largest dedicated Microsoft services partner across the ANZ region. Uh, with over a thousand certified professionals. We have a look at the, the our Microsoft Dynamics business as example, up 20% in New Zealand last year, um, up 16% on the half. And we talk about the half, obviously the second half was somewhat coronavirus affected. Um, the Dynamics business is just going through amazing growth at the moment. And we've got 200 certified professionals in that business alone and, and you know, close to, you know, close to 300 in the Azure area too. So we think it's an amazing opportunity and, and working very, very closely with Microsoft on a lot of their go-to markets and how we can you know, better penetrate the Australian and New Zealand markets together. Quick touch on results. Uh, look, I'm a little disappointed with revenue. You know, people sort of said this is a solid result in coronavirus times, but in my view, you know, it was pretty tough given it's the first year in the history of the company that revenue declined. But revenue was down six percent, and that that really was driven from two things, you know, a, a pretty a, well, a very tough second half, and and particularly the east coast of Australia for us was 
was soft and we are seeing that bounce back, but, but it did get impacted quite strongly. Western Australia amazingly um, performed very, very well through that period. Uh, New Zealand was, was, was slightly down as well. Um, so, so, you know, but I think the work that we've done around responding to shifting and shaping our services to where we're seeing demand in the market, and, uh, and obviously with the back of that Western Power win, we'll see you know, revenue, revenue significantly grow into the FY21 year, and, and we publicly glide that, and we have an outlook statement talking to it shortly. Uh, EBITDA flat at $19 million. Uh, I, I will note that there were some JobKeeper payments in there uh, that, that assisted that number. But, you know, with EBITDA flat, we were, we were pretty, pretty happy with that. Uh, MPAT up. I, I think the highlight of the result was the operating cash flow. Operating cash flows at 20, just shy of $24 million. There was a working capital movement <clears throat> uh, against us last year of $4 million and then a working capital movement in inflow this year of four. So it's kind of a $20 million adjusted number, but still a great result. And that allowed us to reduce debt by uh, $10 million across the period. So free cash flow of 10, uh, which, which we, were, we were delighted with. I, I talk about, you know, confidence and growth into 21 in, in what is a pretty uncertain time. But, you know, if I look at contracted recurring revenues up 55% uh, one July compared to prior period, I mean, that's, that's, a, um, that's a big, big jump in contracted revenues. And so that'll really provide us with a great base coming into the year. And, uh, you know, obviously a big part of that was the Western Power contract that, that we have spoken to. And it just, just, you know, I, I think that there is enormous growth opportunities in Western Power when we made the announcement we said it was 65 million over five years plus uh, project work. And, you know, they're, they're, they're just doing so much in that organisation at the moment. So we do see tremendous growth opportunity there. Um, we we re-signed Rio Tinto uh, Master Services Agreement. Now, Rio Tinto are one of our largest customers, hence it was market sensitive and uh, very important for us to renew. That was against global competition. I, I think there was something like 55 bidders from all over the world. So we were, we were wrapped with that. Um, you know, larger reduction in debt, which I've spoken to. And then I, I think a real standout is New Zealand, even through that coronavirus affected period, has, has grown 11% across the course of the year. And that runs some large multi-million dollar contracts throughout the year, which, which will continue into FY21 with some amazing customers as well, right? Like you look at the, these uh, sort of marquee customers, New Zealand Police, Sky TV, uh, Two Degrees, up and coming telco there. So, so some incredible work being done in New Zealand as well. Uh, Australian revenue down, and as I said, predominantly that is the result of two things. Firstly, it was a, a soft East Coast performance across the second half, um, and which which we which we know is is directly related to areas of our business that was exposed to customers pulling back as a result of uh, COVID nineteen, and and the reduction we lost well, about eighteen months ago now a large customer in main roads, but that really that transitioned out right at the start of FY20. Uh, so that was an immediate step down for us uh, and adjusted for that actually revenue is about flat. So, um, and, and Western Power will be much, much larger than that main roads contract that we refer to here that came out and you know, we, we anticipate potentially up, up to double uh, over time. Uh, so, look, I think the other thing, we invested heavily in growth across the East Coast. We brought in a, a senior executive, the CEO of one of our major competitors on the East Coast to head East Coast operations. He's built a great team around him. And across the course of the year, you know, even in a tough environment, we've said 30%, over 30% jump in that sales pipeline. So pretty excited about what we'll be able to achieve across the East Coast in FY21. Uh, and I think a focus on those larger deals, Western Power was a great win, but as I said, we have an incredible pipeline of opportunity uh, over and above Western Power as we go out. Um, just touching on industry and clients, you'll notice from this graph, look, no major exposure to any one client. I think in the listed tech, tech sector, that's actually quite unique. You find a lot of uh, a lot of our peers have one or two very very large clients. We've got some very large clients, but no one that represents greater than ten percent of revenue, probably eleven or twelve from last year, but around ten, which is which is a good thing to thing I believe. Uh, going into FY twenty one, big focus on public sector. Uh, we we think that in the current time of uncertainty, governments will spend, and we are seeing that, and we're seeing some great opportunity in public sector, uh, and that currently represents 
you know, close to 30% of our business in any account, natural, natural resources. So, you know, that, that is a, um, a protected, you know, kind of an essential service and then somewhat protected. And so we're seeing these guys reasonably strong commodity prices, uh, particularly in iron ore, which we have strong exposure to. And, uh, and we're seeing things, some amazing opportunities in there, in there. So big folks on natural resources and then, you know, finance and insurance market across the East Coast. This, this is a graph just, and the only key takeaway uh, before I finish up on this, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what, what we saw through FY20 with respect to the impact of, um, of coronavirus. And if you look at the black line, that, that is our contracted kind of annuity revenues. And, and, and you see this dip in debt kind of through FY19, and then it's growing throughout the course of FY20. So that says Main Roads comes out and then some smaller contracts that we're winning coming in through as that black line grows into FY20. I'll note that, that the new Western Power contract hadn't started anywhere during FY20. It, it started its first services in July and then July, yeah, it was July for about a third and the balance at the start of August. So that isn't in the black. So that'll continue to grow strongly. Um, but then what I think is really important to note is this yellow. And the yellow is the work that we generate from the managed services contracts in black. So that's kind of like the additional project services. And you can see it's very significant, right? It basically doubles that black line. Now through FY20, you can see as we move into the fourth quarter, the second half in the fourth quarter, this real pinch as the yellow is coming off, but yet we're still winning some, some managed services. So we've got the black growing, but the yellow comes right off quite, quite steeply and it, and it pinches down. And that really, I think, is a result of, of, of kind of delays and deferrals through that, that, certainly that June quarter, but probably the June half. So, you know, we, we're excited as we come into 21, we see, you know, Western Power kick in, we see that black start to really grow to the next level. And in, in, at the same time, all of our existing customers, you see the yellow going back to more typical spend levels. And I think that that provides us an amazing sort of growth opportunity over the next two to three years. I think this graph tells that story pretty well. Um, I, I'm not gonna read out every Outlook statement uh, here uh, other than to say, look, you know, it's, um, I think like everyone, FY20 has, been a challenging year for us. Our financial results were solid. You know, we've put our balance sheet in a very, very strong position. Um, we make statements here that will be net cash by Christmas, and and we continue continue to track to that. Uh, so you know that'll that'll be a great event. It's been many many years since the company's been in a net cash position. So I think balance sheet strong, recurring revenues up strongly. Um, you know, we, we are seeing a strengthening across the East Coast, which, which is good. And as I said, very strong pipeline in terms of our ability to convert that. It's coming through at the moment, which we're pleased with. Um, and all of those things, you know, I believe will lead to solid first half and full year results. And that's what we've, we've said here. So, um, so pretty excited about the outlook and certainly the pipeline and, and thematically where we see the market going. Uh, I don't think there's a space that would be more exciting right now than, than the technology sector. And, and you know, as a digital services company, we, we work with many, many different software and technology providers to ensure that those products and services are delivered to customers successfully. Okay, thanks, uh, Russell. Uh, we've got a good few questions, so we'll try and get through them as quickly as possible. Uh, one I got emailed in ahead of time, but actually uh, I'm going to combine it with one that came in live. It's around the debt. Is the plan to get the debt down to zero? Um, and now that I guess it's already already you know down a lot, um, does this mean you know Empire and the board can start looking at restarting dividends? Because I know you used to be a fairly regular dividend payer back in the early days. Yeah, and I think, Mark, to answer that question, I think you saw the company paying dividends prior to that very strong growth period, and some of that was uh, filled through acquisitions. And so the board made a clear decision that, hey, we wanted to become a much more substantial business. And to do that, the best return for shareholders would actually be to use that cash flow to invest in acquisitions, which is what we did. 
Um, I think the organic opportunities presented to the company at the moment of, of size uh, are such that, you know, while, whilst we will always be an acquisitive firm and we will look at them, I think our priority is some pretty strong organic growth. And that means that, you know, we'll be driving cash flow. And I, I don't want to talk about what we'll do with the cash, but, but obviously we will look at uh, capital management options, which, which may include dividends. Absolutely. Okay. And here's a blast from the past for me anyway. Um, EBITDA margins, you know, as, as the business gets out of this kind of investment period, they're around 10% today. Uh, somebody says the old ASG group used to do kind of 13 to 15% um, before they got taken out. I never know. I think that was back 2013, I think. Um, do you, you know, is it is it possible for Empire to kind of emulate uh, an old competitor's margins or has the industry kind of fundamentally changed in the time since ASG was around? No, look, I, I don't want to talk about margins specific to Empire, but if you look at the industry, I think there's no reason that that yeah, somewhere between 13 and 15% EBITDA margins uh, aren't achievable over the medium term. And, uh, you know, Empire has a very clear strategy around margin expansion and, and that will come with top line growth. You know, we, we, we won't deliver that simply through uh, reduction in cost. That, that'll be a top line growth function. And I spoke at Mainro, uh, Western Power's a great one to talk to around margins, right? So, you know, let's take an arbitrary number and say that's generating 30% of gross profit. Well, to deliver on those services, there's been no additional capex and there's been no additional uh, uplift in overhead costs anywhere in the business, right? So, so naturally, that 30% gross margin falls straight to the EBITDA line. Um, and that's the type of leverage that the business has now. And, and so you'll see EBITDA margin expansion as we win uh, some of those larger, chunky deals like that. And, and Western Power certainly will help drive that. Yeah, just a follow on from that point, maybe a question uh, uh, on the pipeline. I mean, are deals that you're looking at on the East Coast or New Zealand are, you know, are they more similar size to, to kind of Western power, you know, really big ones? Or is it a case of, you know, just rolling up all of these small deals, um, you know, let's say in the five to 10 million bracket, but, you know, over the course of the, the full year, they, they add up to a substantial number? Oh, look, we're certainly chasing the five to $10 million deals everywhere in the company, Mark, not, not just in uh, the East Coast. It would be fair to say we have more of those on the East Coast. How, however, um, you know, the company absolutely is focused on winning some larger deals across the East Coast. And it, it has a pretty solid pipeline in that space right now. In fact, in fact, you know, I'll be honest, I think, Two years ago, we probably didn't have any pipeline in larger deals on the East Coast, whereas we have a number of those in play as we speak. Um, that said, you know, the company doesn't want to get caught up in chasing really large deals that are expensive to chase that we have no ability to close. So we're very selective on the deals that we go after. And, um, and I think it would be fair to say that, you know, the company has a stronger ability to win really large deals on the West Coast than it does on the East. So, so naturally you'll see us chase more here than there at the moment. But, um, but no, we, we're very confident in a couple of significant deals on the East Coast. Okay. Well, so I'm, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us and getting up at the crack of dawn over there in WA. Um, and if anybody wants to get in touch with uh, you to find out more about uh, Empired, uh, what's the best way to get in touch with yourself or I see David is on here, David Hinton, the CFO. Yeah, look, probably in the first instance, go through David uh, and then David can kind of filter those questions and we can go from there. Okay, great. Okay, thanks everybody for joining. I'm going to leave it there because I know the opening match is just about to start. So I'll let people get back to their desks and their screens. Uh, thanks once again to, to Russell and David for joining us. And uh, yeah, as I said, the video for this will be up on the YouTube channel probably by latest uh, sometime on Monday. Okay, thanks everyone. Wonderful. Thanks, Thank you everyone. Cheers. Thanks. thanks.